Chan Su Wat often recommended that we start each meditation by developing an attitude of conviction and confidence in what we're doing. Meditation, he said, was a high level of work. Something we should feel inspired and fortunate that we have the chance to do this. So as you meditate, you don't just go through the motions. You give it your whole attention. You give it your whole mind, your whole heart. And the confidence here doesn't necessarily mean that we're confident it's going to go well every time we meditate, but we're confident that we are doing something good. And regardless of the immediate results, the long-term results are going to be good. And in the meantime, we learn. Meditation is not a crapshoot. You do have the opportunity to observe what you're doing as you meditate and the results you get. And through that you get a better and better sense of your mind. Awakening is not, again, it's not just a fluke occurrence. It comes through knowing your mind thoroughly, knowing what kind of intentions it has, what kind of results they give. And that kind of knowledge goes through many levels. It's not an all-or-nothing sort of affair. That image the Buddha gives of the continental shelf off of India. There is a point where awakening is sudden, but it doesn't happen without your gradual practice leading up to it. The suddenness is when all the factors of the path finally come together. But the gradual aspect of that is the part where you get more and more sensitive to what's actually going on in your mind. And it's your heightened sensitivity that will enable you to see something that's happening all the time. The way the mind takes the potentials from the past and shapes them into a present experience. We're doing that all the time. To make that distinction between a mystery and a puzzle, a mystery is when all the evidence is there and you just want to figure out which pieces are important. The puzzle is when pieces are missing. Here it's a mystery, why we're causing ourselves suffering. Everything that we need to know is right here. both in terms of how things are caused and what can be done to put an end to the suffering. And simply we haven't ferreted out which things are most important to know. And our gaze isn't steady enough. Our sensitivity isn't refined enough. So we're missing things that are right before our eyes. But over time the meditation does develop that sensitivity that you need. Sometimes the progress can seem so gradual that it doesn't even seem like progress. Sometimes you can actually see the mind regress when it goes from a fairly quiet mood to a totally scattered, distracted mood. But the mind is a complex process, and complex processes have their ups and downs. But there is a gradual tendency, if you stick with a meditation and you apply as much attention as you can to what you're doing, and asking the right questions. It's the questions that turn simple awareness into discernment. Figure out what's the cause, what's the effect, which causes lead to skillful, excuse me, which causes are skillful, lead to good results, and which causes are unskillful lead to bad results. That question should always be in the back of your mind. Because those two questions are the ones that eventually lead you to see things in terms of the formidable truths.
In other words, looking at what's going on simply as events and connections between events, seeing what the events do. And learning how to use that knowledge for the purpose of putting an end to suffering. So meditation does involve some thinking. It's not simply being barely aware. It means you're aware and you're questioning, curious, trying to see what works. And sometimes it involves thinking to get into concentration as well. There's a passage where Mahanama, who was one of the Buddha's cousins, came to see him. He said, okay, the monks are leaving. I need a lesson on how to practice while the monks are gone. It was nearing the ends of the range retreat. Monks were working on their robes, and as soon as they were finished with their robes, they were, they were out of there, going off into the forest, going off into the wilderness. And Mahanama wanted some lessons to keep in mind while they were gone. He said, what dwelling should I use for my mind? And the Buddha recommended six recollections. Recollection of the Buddha, the Dharma, the Sangha, virtue, generosity and devas, to keep these things in mind while you're living at home with your children. And you'll find that it would lead the mind to a sense of well-being, sense of confidence. And from that sense of confidence, the mind will eventually get concentrated. So these are ways of thinking that actually lead the mind into concentration. They're a kind of right resolve. There's another passage where a monk is out in the forest, and he's sitting in his little forest hut. But instead of meditating properly, he's thinking thoughts of sensuality, thoughts of ill will, thoughts of harmfulness. And a deva comes to him and says, you're not attending appropriately the way you should be. And how to get the mind back into right resolve? Once so again, think of the Buddha, the Dharma, the Sangha, your virtue, generosity. So these forms of meditation are a type of right resolve. And right resolve is meant to bring the mind to concentration. This is a theme we find throughout the canon. That not only does right resolve build on right view, but it aims at right concentration, getting the mind to be settled down. There's another passage where the Buddha says you're trying to focus on the breath, trying to focus on the body in and of itself, or feelings in and of themselves, or any of the four establishings of mindfulness. And you find that the mind simply won't settle down. In the Buddhist terms, there's a fever. There's a restlessness. And so to allay that fever, you think of any one of these themes. For instance, you think of the Buddha. How fortunate we are that we have his teaching still alive, and what an amazing person he was. He was destined for a life of power, wealth, sensual pleasures, but he decided that that wasn't what he wanted. And so he left it all, went off into the forest. We see very little of that today. And when he found the true happiness that he did want, he came out and he taught it freely, walked all over northern India. Anywhere there was anyone ready to learn, he would go there and he would teach. Even to the last day of his life, there was one more person he knew he had to teach. So even though he was suffering from dysentery, he walked many miles. And that night there was the one last person there. Wanderer named Subhadda. And so it was soon after he taught Subhadda that he passed away. So he was on his deathbed, and he still taught. So that's the kind of person the Buddha was. That's the sort of person who found the Dharma that we're practicing. 
You can think in similar ways about the Dharma and the Sangha to get yourself inspired about what you're doing here. And as for yourself, sometimes you need to get yourself inspired about yourself. That's what the reflection on virtue, generosity, and the devas is all about. You look at your precepts and you realize you're not harming anybody as you observe these precepts. The ability to live a life that's harmless, that's a rare thing in this world. We don't have to fight anybody to gain our food, our clothing, shelter, medicine. You don't have to push people out of the arena. We live off of people's generosity, things that they've freely given. So our livelihood is pure, not killing, stealing, engaging in illicit sex or wrong speech. It's rare to be able to live this kind of life. So you can look at your behavior and say, there's nobody I've harmed, and allow yourself to feel joy and well-being over that. That gives energy to the practice. A similar principle with generosity. You can think about the times you've been generous in the past to remind yourself that you're not a weight on the world. And even though there are times when you have op operated out of selfish motives, there are other times when you gave freely. Remind yourself of that. You do have some goodness. The recollection of the devas is a similar sort of, sort of thing. You think about the qualities that lead people to become devas, and you reflect that you have those qualities in yourself. A sense of shame over the idea of doing something evil sense of compunction that you wouldn't want to engage in evil. Virtue, generosity, conviction, wisdom, these are all qualities that lead people to become devas. And you've got them to some extent. Buddha says as you reflect on that, your views get straightened out, both about the Buddha, the Dharma, the Sangha, and about yourself, reminding yourself that this is a good path to be on, and you're a worthy person to be on the path. That gives rise to a sense of ease, a sense of well-being, and then through that you can get the mind to settle down and be still, get concentrated. You read sometimes about People who are afraid of concentration, the mind actually gets concentrated and they feel somehow that they don't deserve it, or that it couldn't really be the kind of concentration the Buddha is talking about. A lot of people, mm -hmm. especially in modern society, go around feeling unworthy. So here's an antidote to that. We're on a worthy path and we're worthy of the path. And this is one of the ways in which right resolve, the resolve to think of ways that lead to renunciation, a lack of ill will, and a lack of harm, and get the mind in a position where it's ready to settle down and be still. So you can think your way into concentration. Focus on the breath, you evaluate the breath. Again, there's thinking even in the first jhana as you direct your thought to the breath and evaluate it. Notice which ways of breathing feel really good and how to take that good feeling. Let it spread around the body, soak through the body. So all you have to do is sit here and breathe, and be with the body sitting here breathing. You have the body drenched in ease and fullness, refreshment.
That's right resolve on a higher level, thinking on a higher level. Again, it's part of this process of thinking your way into concentration, getting yourself in the right mood, having the right attitude to what we're doing here. Because this kind of thinking is useful in getting ready, and then it's an also a useful kind of thinking in that it's easy to let go. If you come into the meditation with all sorts of unskillful thoughts about yourself, about the practice, those are hard to let go. They're sticky. It's as if you have sap on your hands, and you've got a, you're holding on to a branch in this sap in the branch that sticks to your hands, and then that makes the branch stick to your hands. You try to throw it away, and it doesn't. it's hard to let go. So skillful thinking is, is like a solvent that can wash away that sap. And then the, the solvent evaporates, and there you are. ready to settle down and enjoy the concentration with a sense of confidence and conviction that this is something really good, and you're really fortunate to be able to do it.